Okay, so you'll recall that uh, last week we talked about the Four Noble Truths, and the fourth of the Four Noble Truths is the Eightfold Path. And I'm giving the same series at Tomoka Correctional Institution right now. And so when I started uh, that talk this week, the Zen monk that comes up from, Var from Bavard County says, so if there's four noble truths and the last one is the Eightfold Path, why aren't there 12 noble truths? <laughs> And I told him to shut up. So <laughs> if anybody was thinking about asking me that question, forget it. But, no. uh, you know, I'm not really a sports fan. I don't really do sports and I don't or watch sports anyway. And I'm not usually a sports metaphor person. But I was thinking about this this week. And this football player who was kind of famous when I was a kid came to mind. And when that sort of thing happens, I sort of listen and see what the teaching is there. This guy was, uh, yeah, he played for Texas Tech, and this was when I lived in Lubbock. And um, he went on to play for the Green Bay Packers later, and this was in the late 60s. <clears throat> and the um, story was that he had been, a, either when he was in another college or in high school, before he got to Lubbock, that he had been very, very talented. And um, he was super, super fast, really good at evading tacklers and, and all that kind of stuff. And he apparently had bragged at one point that the, the team was successful because of him, that the team would be nothing if it wasn't for him. And so apparently his teammates reacted to this by allowing him to play a game by himself. <laughs> <laughs> and the, they would hand him the ball and then they'd just kind of stand there and let, watch the other team run over him. And I, you know, and I thought about this, and apparently, by the way, he became much less arrogant after that and, and a lot more of a team player. But, you know, if you ask people on a football team, what's the key to success? The tackle is gonna say, well, let's get into the quarterback before he gets rid of the ball. And the quarterback's going to say something like, well, long, accurate passes. And somebody else is going to say being able to catch a pass and run fast with it and, and that sort of thing. So, but the truth is, if you want to successfully play football, you've got to be able to move your ball toward your goal. And you've got to be able to stop the other team from moving the, the ball toward their goal. And to do that, you need the whole team. And it's kind of the same thing with the Eightfold Path. You'll hear things like, um, well, the Dalai Lama says stuff like, my religion is compassion. And you read Thich Nhat Hanh, and sometimes it sounds like the all, Buddhism is all about mindfulness. But the reality is, compassion is very important. Mindfulness is very important. But if you want to move toward spiritual progress, and if you want to keep those things that hinder you from, from holding you back, then you really need the whole path. If you put it in gardening terms, you know, if you, you plant the seeds that you want to grow and then you nurture the things that you want to have bear fruit, and you pull the weeds that would take away resources from that. So, <clears throat> just to review the Four Noble Truths a little bit, I mean, the whole point of all of this is to deal with this Buddhist word, dukkha, stress, suffering. And the first truth is that there is stress. And the second truth is that the cause for stress really comes from our mind's involvement with what happens. And it comes from clinging. And there's a way to transcend stress by ceasing that clinging and craving. And the path to that is the Eightfold Path. So, to, and the Eightfold Path is right view, right understanding, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And so now you all know what to do, go do it. <laughs> no, we're gonna break it down a little bit. Because it, it's a lot easier to approach the path if you, if you break it into three parts. In Theravada Buddhism, they have this concept, the trisika. They break it into sila, samadhi, and panya. Okay. Sila is usually translated as morality. And it contains the third, fourth, and fifth factor of the Eightfold Path. 
So right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And I mentioned it's usually translated as morality or, or something along those lines. I don't like the word morality because the root of morality is, is more a, and basically these are rules that society makes. And so we usually think in the West of morality as being something that's sort of handed down by some deity or it's the social rules. Um, and really, something can be moral but still be wrong. If you look kind of historically, you know, people have, there have been times that various forms of discrimination were practiced and morality was the justification for that. So it's not that kind of morality. It's much more has to do with ethics, which is maybe a little bit less relativistic. And you, you can be a little bit more analytical in, in your approach to ethics in terms of um, whether an action causes harm or not. Buddhist action is based on the principle of not causing harm. So. <clears throat> And one of the one of the areas where the Buddha kind of departed from the rules of society was with things like the caste system. He would actually say things like, "You're not a Brahmin because of birth. Brahmins were the highest caste. You know, these were the people who were supposedly closest to God." He would say, "You're a Brahmin because you restrain your actions and you restrain your mind." So to be a Brahmin meant you had to develop virtue. So it's useful to think of cultivating sila or practicing sila as a matter of cultivating virtue. So, what does that mean? Basically it means practicing compassion in terms of our actions of body and speech. That's where these things all fall under. And we think a lot in terms of restraint, but it's also giving. So right speech, right action, right livelihood, sort of a two-part process of being generous, giving away, and of being restraining in terms of what we don't do. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you what the Buddha said about these three factors of the path. He says, and what is right speech? Abstaining from lying, abstaining from divisive speech, abstaining from abusive speech, abstaining from idle chatter. This, monks, is called right speech. And what is right action? Abstaining from taking life, abstaining from stealing, abstaining from unchastity. This is called right action. And what is right livelihood? I love this one. There's a case where a disciple of the noble once having abandoned dishonest livelihood keeps his life going with right livelihood. This is called right livelihood. We'll have a whole other talk sometime on what right livelihood is because it's basically not wrong livelihood. There's some, there's some more elements to that that we'll come up to later. But the point of this practice is to end suffering for ourselves and for others. And so basically this concept is sila, the right actions of body and speech. Uh, you're not doing things that lead to harm for yourself or other people. You know, most of the people who come to our meetings don't come in and ask me, how should I act? Almost everybody comes in and says, I want to learn how to meditate. And I think a lot of Americans, that's kind of the approach that we take to Buddhism. But the Buddha didn't teach this first. And a lot of Asians don't meditate. They come to Buddhism and they practice, they basically take the five precepts and they give alms to monks on alms rounds and give offerings to temples. And we don't put a lot of stock in that, but it's worth thinking about. So, so first, when the, when the Buddha was kind of pressed to go a little farther in his explanation of the path, that eventually developed into what we call the five precepts. These are training rules. Nobody says you can't do this and you can't do that. 
Instead, the Buddha said, okay, if you want spiritual freedom, then you should set your mind on not doing certain things. And there's five things. Not to kill. The Pali word is uh, uh, basically translates as cutting off the breath. You don't make something stop breathing. <laughs> um, in modern Buddhism and in some Mahayana Buddhism and so on, it's, it's pretty common to take that a little farther and say not to kill or cause harm, willfully cause harm. And I think that's a good way of looking at it. Not to take what isn't freely given. So it's not just stealing. You know, there are a lot of people who will spend their lives, you know, cheating people by selling bogus timeshares and, you know, things like that. That's still taking what isn't freely given. Somebody might be giving you something, but there's attachments to it. Not to engage in a harmful sexual activity. There's no list of what you can't do. Okay? If it causes harm, you shouldn't do it. Not to engage in harmful speech. And he says, you know, lying, divisive, harsh speech, that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, not to engage in intoxicants that cloud your mind. So the first four really are to protect society. Okay. The last one is to protect your mindfulness so that you remember that. It's so basically protecting your vow to not do these things. Because if you get drunk, you're liable to do something that you wouldn't have done when you were sober, right? So, <clears throat> Taking these precepts is an act of restraint. I'm going to restrain my body. Meditating is an act of restraining the mind. If you can't restrain your actions of body and speech, how good are you going to be at restraining your actions of mind? And so I think this is one of the reasons why the Buddha would teach this first before he taught meditation in the, in the, the five... Uh, themes of progressive importance, this one was near number one. Okay. Again, if you're spending your days cheating people or something like that, what happens when you sit down to meditate? How can you sit down and calm your mind if you spend all day really kind of practicing duplicity? You can't see clearly if you're not living in a kind of straightforward, honest way. So. <clears throat> When you go to a meditation retreat or something, usually the first thing that you do is you take the precepts. That kind of helps you clean the slate. Okay, I recognize that maybe I've been doing some things I shouldn't have done. Now let me set my heart on not doing those things and living according to a straighter pattern while I'm practicing meditation, by the way. The other part of this is letting go. The first thing we do when we start a service is we light some incense, we're giving it away. We're getting the sort of counterintuitive benefit that comes from letting go of something. We could, I've said this before. Some of you have heard me say it a few times. We're probably bored with it by now. But if I passed out sticks of incense to you and said, here's your incense, it wouldn't do you any good. When you burn it, when you give it up, then it merges with the environment. You get to appreciate its value. And it's kind of the same thing with all, all forms of giving. If you've got enough to share, then you can appreciate the value of, of that. Giving and practicing the precepts uh, are really not just a gift to others. I mean, when you, if, if I take the precepts, I'm giving away something to y'all. Okay? I'm giving you freedom from harm, right? If you, if you take the precepts and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not engage in harmful speech, and you really keep that, then you just gave all your co-workers freedom from being the object of your gossip, right? Okay. That's kind of one way of looking at that. But you're also giving something to yourself. Because the, the, I've mentioned Albert Ellis uh, probably last week. 
he, he's, he was one of the people that kind of helped me clarify how Buddhism worked on a sort of day-to-day -day level because even though he wasn't a Buddhist, a lot of the principles are the same. And he would talk about things like ethics as being a form of enlightened self-interest. You don't harm others because you want to live in a society where people don't harm others. You contribute to things like your spiritual community because you want this to the benefits of the spiritual community. You want it to be there for you. You know, when you go to, when I went to Thailand, we visited this one temple one night. It's a place where a lot of people went for funerals. And there was a funeral going on there. There was a casket set up and uh, pictures of the woman who had died. And the family all came over and the monks chanted and then everybody ate and all of this. And Tan Chao Kun was talking about the importance of this to the community and said, you know, you don't have to hire a funeral home because you've got one. You've been supporting this temple. This is yours. You don't have to go out and rent tables. The temple has tables because you've been making donations. You know, everybody's been contributing to this. And so this community asset that belongs to everybody is there. So, and it's the same with charities and stuff like that, too. You know, we ask you to bring in food for the neighborhood center once in a while. Well, I hope it never happens to any of you, but when we do things like that, we're keeping an organization going that will be there for us or for our friends or family in a time of need. So you've got kind of a double benefit there. When you give, you learn how to let go of things. If you're meditating and something comes up that you want to cling to in meditation, you know how to let go of it because you've been given, you know, if you can give away a few bucks, you can give away a thought that's causing you trouble, right? If you can restrain your actions so you're not causing harm to others, then when thoughts come up that hinder your spiritual progress, you can restrain that too. So the, when I say the path, you need the whole path to work, they really do work together. You can look at these as separate things, but once you start trying to put them into action, training the body, training the speech, training the mind are all the same thing. It's just a matter of where you're putting your focus at that particular time.